Okay, um, so I'd like to introduce Matt Jenkins. So Matt's over here visiting uh, a number of us in, in the Institute. Uh, so Matt's doing his PhD at the University of Otago, um, and he has the great pleasure of working with uh, two of my doctoral supervisors. Um, they tell me that he's a much better student than I was, so we're expecting uh, great things from his presentation today. So. No pressure there, Chris. No pressure at all. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Chris. And I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity to actually present my stuff so far. I'm quite early in the in the sort of PhD process, but as Chris said, my research is spanning quite a few different sort of areas, and this department in particular, looking at mindfulness and also self determination theory. Um, my research is is very much encompassed in both of those, so. Hopefully you'll find something interesting in this and I'm also looking for your sort of feedback in terms of where my research is going to go because it's going to mean a lot, there's a lot of experts in the room so it's almost all, also quite intimidating looking at all these faces but hopefully you can be a friendly light and give me some feedback at the end. So specifically I'm looking at uh, mindfulness and motivation and how these two sort of come together and looking at psychological flexibility and autonomous motivation specifically within the physical activity context. So I thought it would be a good idea to start off with, um, I don't want to preach to the choir, but a couple of definitions. So, and a sort of overview of the problem that we're facing with physical activity at the moment. So physical activity is any bodily movement that increases energy expenditure. So we can distinguish this between, uh, from exercise for example. So exercise is essentially a part of physical activity it's one component of, but obviously physical activity can encompass things like active transport to work, uh, domestic chores, etc. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail of this. I think the benefits, especially, like I said, the guys in the room should know this already. There's various benefits to regular physical activity. Um, and a key sort of statistic, I suppose, is the fact that it's the fourth leading, physical inactivity is the fourth leading cause of mortality worldwide according to the World Health Organization. So it's a huge global public health issue. Um, so we can, when we're talking about physical activity, there's certain recommendations of how much we're supposed to be doing. And there are three sort of subpopulations, I suppose, what we're looking at. So we've got uh, sort of children and adolescents, which I know that is a big focus in this department in particular. Um, we've got the older adults, over 65, and we've got the sort of mid-range, so 18 to 64. And this is the population that I'm interested in, this sort of mid-range population. The reason for this, and I've been asked this a few times, um, obviously there's great benefit in looking at adolescent physical activity uh, and also older adults, but on a personal level, um, it's my experience. I've always worked with these people. I used to work as a personal trainer back in the UK. And it was always a big issue when I'm working with this population. I'd have so many cancellations in terms of personal training sessions. And for me, it was very motivating to try and figure out why. And this is what led me into doing the sports psychology and exercise psycho uh, psychology masters. And eventually doing what I'm doing now for PhD. So just to give you a bit of background, now we've got some New Zealand statistics here. Um, mainly because I like the diagram, it's very uh, picturesque. So we've got around 48% of people in New Zealand uh, actually do enough physical activity to meet the guidelines. So I think all these green here are doing all right. Then the blue lot just do just a bit of activity and then the ones at the bottom don't do any at all. So it's a very big issue. Um, it's very similar levels across the world. I know Australia is I think 40% someone might be able to correct me on that. But there's also different metrics in terms of measuring physical activity. So we've got the whole 10,000 step count, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, but essentially, yeah, this is the population that I'm looking at at the moment, New Zealand. So the big question is how we approach this problem. So like I said, when I was back in the UK as a personal trainer, it always interested me as to why these people would always cancel, why people couldn't adhere to exercise. That sort of classic statistic that within six months, 
um, of starting an exercise program, people would drop out, 50% of people would drop out. Um, so because I was in an ideal position, I was doing my masters, I was in an ideal position to look at theories of motivation. So one of the key phrases that I always got from clients, and even now when I discuss motivation for ex uh, exercise and physical activity, is always people want more motivation. Um, so this idea that you need quantitatively more motivation to be able to sustain exercise. So this actually fits in perfectly with the theory that I'm looking at, uh, self-determination theory. And when I say fits in perfectly, I mean it completely goes against everything because self-determination theory, rather than looking at the amount of uh, motivation that somebody has, it looks at the, the quality of motivation. So essentially, self-determination theory comes up, it gives you two types of motivation. So we've got the controlled motivation, which is characterized by rewards or punishments, uh, guilt, anxiety, or pride. And then we have autonomous or self-determined motivation, which is all about the enjoyment or love, which is pure intrinsic motivation. I'm sure a lot of people here know about that. And then also for the valuing the uh, physical activity outcomes. So we're looking at health and family. So the key difference between these two is that controlled motivation for exercise or physical activity is that feeling pressurized, having to do something. Whereas autonomous is more about wanting to do something. So the key outcomes in terms of uh, these different types of motivation have different sort of consequences. So a key outcome <laughs> by a systematic review showed that there's no positive association between controlled motivation for PA and, uh, and PA behavior. Whereas autonomous motivation has been consistently shown to be the single best color of PA behavior. So we want people to be autonomously motiv motivated for physical activity, it's pretty clear. If we can get people autonomously motivated, then they're gonna be more sustainable in terms of uh, continued exercise behavior. So we've got this idea of internalizing motivation. So getting people to become more autonomous in what they're doing. And this is largely based on basic psychological th need theory. So the idea behind this is that there are three basic psychological needs. And if a behavioral context can satisfy these needs or help to satisfy, then this is going to energize behavior and help to internalize this motivation. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these. So we've got autonomy. So it's volition and choice over one's actions. We've got competence, which is the ability to be effective in the surrounding environments, and relatedness, which is social connectedness and reciprocal community. So essentially we're looking at doing what you want, how you want to do it, feeling like you can do it, and also feeling connected to others whilst doing it. So the idea is if a behavioral context can actually support these needs, then it's more likely to be autonomous. And this is what uh, self-determination theory interventions are based on providing this autonomy support, which is a, probably a bit of a misnomer really. Some people call it need support because obviously there are three psychological needs, not just autonomy. But we call it autonomy support. And this comes from the social context. It always comes from other people. Um, this is how we approach it in interventions. It always comes from like the teachers, for example, the coaches. And for me, doing my work was also as a personal trainer. It always comes from an external content. The idea that providing autonomy support leads to need satisfaction, which in turn leads to autonomous motivation, and this theoretically leads to increased PA behavior. And this sort of protocol has been shown to be effective in adolescents, in adults. Um, I found it as well doing my the personal training. I actually ran my intervention with some clients, and I found significant results. Uh, and these are quite consistent findings. So autonomy supportive interventions have demonstrated positive results in PA promotion. And this is all great, but it's been suggested that there's been an overemphasis on the social psychology of motivation. Um, like I said before, it's all about the social context and how the social context can influence a person in terms of what they're doing in their physical activity. 
But in fact, Brandon Ryan in 2004, Rich Ryan obviously who's based here at the moment, it's a shame that he's not here today, um, talks about the inner supports for autonomous motivation. We're not just talking about the, the social context. There's a potential for having an inner support. So for this, specifically, he's referring to mindfulness. So mindfulness has obviously uh, got various definitions, and I'm going to stick to a relatively basic one. So we've got a two-component model, which has been uh, suggested by Bishop in 2004. First component being awareness. So this is awareness of all current experiences. So this is awareness of thoughts, feelings, sensations, and also acceptance which is the non-judgmental acceptance of all these thoughts, feelings, and sensations. So actually, in self-determination theory, the theoretical link has been made between awareness, specifically, and autonomous motivation. Again, this is Brown and Ryan in 2003. So they suggested that an increased awareness is actually more likely to lead to autonomous motivation in general. The idea being that increased awareness leads to increased awareness of needs and values, which in turn leads to behaviour driven by needs and values, and therefore more autonomous. And this has been shown to be the case in a couple of studies. Um, so, for example, Brown and Ryan, they found that in a day-to-day -day, uh, behaviour, increased awareness using their mindful awareness scale was associated with autonomous motivation. And then we've got the uh, one based in Turkey, Ozzy Essel, I hope I'm saying that right, I'm not sure. So they also found that awareness was associated with autonomous motivation, but also need satisfaction as well. But this is all well and good, but we've still got this component of mindfulness that's sort of gone missing here, this acceptance. And acceptance happens to be a key part of something called psychological flexibility. So psychological flexibility is uh, it's the primary aim of something of a mindfulness-based intervention called acceptance and commitment therapy. And it can be defined as being in contact with the present moment as a conscious human being, fully and without defense, and persisting or changing behavior in the service of chosen values. The key point here is that value-driven behavior is not always pleasurable and comfortable. Sometimes you have to go through discomfort in order to achieve these, these value behaviors. An acceptance of all this experience um, allows this value-driven behaviour to occur despite potential discomfort. So we can put that in an exercise context. Um, if you're a person that's just starting exercise, for example, you're going to be sweating, you're going to be fatigued on a regular basis for those initial first few months or first couple of weeks. Acceptance of these experiences uh, is probably more likely to you know, lead to continuous value-driven behaviour. So this acceptance is a major component of psychological flexibility. It's a key, key aspect in value-driven behaviour. So it's not just acceptance that's part of this, the whole model, psychological flexibility. We've got these six different processes. So we'll start from the top. So we've got contact with the present moment, which is being in the moment, and essentially the same as present moment awareness. So this is thoughts, feelings, and sensations. And again, go over acceptance. So this is acceptance of all current experiences, whether they're positive, negative, comfortable, uncomfortable. Something called cognitive diffusion. So this is distancing yourself from thoughts that aren't particularly helpful. So in an exercise context, this could be something like, I can't do this, people will laugh at me. This is going to go horribly wrong. If you can see that, thought as just a mental process rather than a literal truth, it's less likely to guide your behaviour, at least control your behaviour. And then we have self as context. Uh, so this is not being attached to unhelpful self con uh, concepts. So certain, certain people may not see themselves as an exerciser, for example, uh, and this can be proved to be a controlling factor in terms of behaviour. So these four here, the mindfulness-based aspects of psychological flexibility. We have a couple of behavioral ones as well. So we've got committed action, which is committing to making sustained behavioral change and making plans. 
and then we have values. So this is really value clarification, knowing what your values are, um, such as family or health. So to put this into a, a real life context, I suppose, um, I've recently become, well, I've tried to, I would say become, uh, in the last six months I've tried to do swing dancing, right? So I am, I always thought that I was going to be absolutely fine with swing dancing. I'm a sports person, I'm relatively coordinated and I can, you know, I can play football, I can play basketball. So I always assumed that when I took on swing dancing, piece of cake, I'll be able to walk through it, well, dance through it, literally. See this? When I first started, it was the most uncomfortable thing and I felt so useless at doing it. I've never felt so useless at doing anything before in my life. And what made it harder was the fact that I saw myself as a sports person. I was, I, I'm used to moving around, I'm used to being coordinated. So to go into this, this room with these other people all looking at me, or so I thought, um, it was really hard to let go of that self-concept that I was this coordinated person and just having to let go of that sort of thing. So that was... That's an example of me being attached, at least initially, to this thing called a uh, conceptualized self, which is the opposite of self as context. Um, I didn't want my identity as a coordinated sports person to be threatened, so um, there's a few times when I really wanted to avoid going into these swing lessons because I didn't want to put myself out there and sort of destroy my own self-image. Um, similarly, cognitive diffusion the amount of times I predicted that people were going to be laughing at me or my dance partner would get bored of my very limited repertoire. Um, sometimes I had to stop getting in contact with the present moment and realise that these are just thoughts that are just happening and these, these predictions aren't necessarily going to come true. So this was very important for me at the start. Um, and acceptance, obviously, the acceptance of feelings of anxiety and feelings of um, embarrassment, if nothing else, of just putting myself out there and trying to dance. And I'm still not a good dancer, but at least I can sort of, uh, I'll, I'll go with it now. I can accept everything that's going to happen. And you can see why that's a, a problem for exercise as well. You think about someone who hasn't been physically active for a long time. They're going to go to um, a gym, for example, and they're going to feel self-conscious. They're going to feel like they can't do certain things. I'll make predictions about people looking at them, for example. So this idea that psychological flexibility, it can be very important for beginning uh, an exercise regime, for example. So obviously my research, uh, what I said at the top, is that I'm looking at sort of amalgamating these two theories. So I've got self-determination theory on one hand, which is autonomous motivation, and psychological flexibility. These share a very key common factor, and that's that autonomous motivation, unless it's pure intrinsic motivation, is value-guided. Um, and also psychological flexibility is obviously defined by the fact that it's, it's guided by values. So these are two really key things, uh, sort of parallels between the two. The difference is that self-determination theory-based interventions look to social context, so they're using autonomy support to sort of facilitate this autonomous motivation. Whereas psychological flexibility is all about developing these inner supports for um, a value-guided behaviour. So developing the tools in order to be able to sort of go ahead and, and behave in a valued way. So my question is, is the relationship between autonomous, autonomous motivation and psychological flexibility? And specifically, can psychological flexibility, as a sort of toolkit, I suppose, support autonomous motivation in any way. So my argument, or my theory, is it can. So PF here, which represents psychological flexibility, increases the capacity for behavioural choice. So rather than being controlled by uh, behavioural choices in order to avoid certain situations or certain feelings, uh, psychological flexibility affords an increased sense of behavioural choice. So, going back to self-determination theory, that translates into an increased level of autonomy. It also should, theoretically, increase the capacity to overcome challenges. If you're willing to accept that things aren't always going to be easy, you're more likely to be able to overcome your own personal challenges. 
And again, going back to self-determination theory, that should lead to increased perceived competence. Um, so this is what I'm arguing for. And my research questions are based on this. Essentially, it's looking at the relationships between these psychological, the, the mindfulness-based psychological flexibility processes. So that's awareness, acceptance, cognitive diffusion, and self as context. And whether these together influence need satisfaction or, and autonomous motivation for uh, physical activity. And the second aspect is whether we can develop an intervention that brings these two together. So the self-determination theory-based stuff is already sort of well established. Autonomy support leads to autonomous motivation. Can the inclusion of psychological flexibility components actually aid autonomous motivation within um, an intervention? So my, my PhD project, which has just got underway, study one, which has just started, well, last month, so I'm just waiting for data or data to come in. Um, so that's going to be a confirmatory factor analysis. Then I've got a second study, which is going to be path analysis, and I'll go through all these shortly. And then study three is my intervention. So first study I've got going on now is the preliminary CFA. So it's assessing psychological flexibility within a PA context. Um, do the measures of mindfulness-based psychological flexibility load onto a higher order factor, which we'll be calling mindfulness-based psychological flexibility? And is this factor positively associated with the existing measure of PA-specific psychological flexibility? So the aim of this initial CFA is to see if these uh, processes, well, to assess these processes within a PA context, which has never really been done before. Um, all the measures are quite generic. They're, they're, they're just general context stuff. And in fact, there's some measures. I've got a handout there. Um, if you want to pass that around, I think I printed out 15, so that should be about right, actually. So I've chosen four measures from the sort of ACT paradigm or the psychological flexibility paradigm that um, reflects awareness, acceptance, uh, self as context, and cognitive diffusion. So, I've given these uh, question, uh, this questionnaire set out, and this is um, this has been done online using Qualtrics. I think a few of you are familiar with Qualtrics, although this has been done as a, an online survey. So, um, it's gone out to a few organisations. Uh, initially, it went out to one large organisation, Department of Conservation, New Zealand, which is where I hit my first sort of roadblock where they um, turned around on the, the first day of data collection and said actually we can't do this. And this is an interesting thing because the, the questionnaire set that you got there, they looked at these four measures of awareness, acceptance, diffusion, self as context. And on the day that it is due to, to go out for data collection, the survey is due to go live to the employees, which is a huge sample, like 8,000 which would have pretty much covered my, uh, my sample size. They turned around and said that it's, uh, it's too sensitive. They're asking the set of the questions that are being asked are too sensitive. And the, the phrase they actually used that was that some of the people that had tested the thing in the HR department um, came away feeling depressed. Which, I mean, I've looked at these questionnaires numerous times. I've, I did pilot studies with lots of different people internationally. Uh, I've looked at lots of research, obviously, when I was looking at the questionnaires themselves, and it's the first time that I've ever heard that. So we're thinking that it might be a political thing and they just overcommitted some time. But yeah, so that was my first roadblock in terms of data collection, um, actually getting people to, to take this. But now it's gone out to several different district councils um, and it, the response rate, although it's quite low, like, I mean, online questionnaires, talking 25%, so it's creeping up. Um, but yeah, this is what I'm trying to do. So we've got these four measures. What I want to see is if the mindfulness, if the uh, these four measures or these four factors load onto a higher order factor, which is mindfulness-based psychological flexibility. Um, this model, I suppose, is not really... I'm going to have to speak into 
to Phil last week. They might be changing this into a bifactor model. But as things stand, they're looking at a sort of second order um, confirmatory factor analysis. But I'm looking at how I'm going to approach that still, I'm trying to learn. So, why, why is it, did you want to focus on a higher order factor rather than a first order factors? Because I wanted to, this is what I was going to go into next. I wanted to see, because there's a, already an established measure for PA specific psychological flexibility. And the path analysis is much large, much larger than this. Um, like for example, the self-determination theory questionnaire, the BREC, the behavior regulation. An exercise questionnaire is 24 questions long. Essentially, it was a huge um, questionnaire set and I piloted it with a couple of people. One person took 50 minutes to do one questionnaire set. So the idea was that I could try and break this down and instead of using these four within the larger set, I could actually just use the one measure um, as a sort of as a rep like a representation of those four. So that's why I'm trying to get like this higher order factor rather than using the, the first order factors. And that's essentially what the, the first study is about, trying to break this down and see how these all fit in together. Um, and then the path analysis. So again, hopefully this is represented by those four measures. So we've got the physical activity specific psychological flexibility which hopefully is uh, associated with autonomy and competence, which in turn should be associated with autonomous motivation and in turn with physical activity. And I know that there's, it's Rob Brockman, isn't it? The guy that's a PhD student here. He's not here today, unfortunately. I know that he's looking at potentially how psychological flexibility can actually bypass need satisfaction and self-determination theory. Um, so it would be interesting to get his thoughts on that. I've emailed him. I think we're going to have a Sky meeting next week. But he thinks that it actually bypasses need satisfaction rather than going through it. But I suppose the results of my second study might really confirm or, you know, we'll see what happens with that, I suppose. Um, and then there's also the idea that psychological flexibility can go directly to physical activity. I'm not sure how likely that is. There's some research quite recently that's looked at how uh, psychological flexibility can affect exercise cognitions, self-efficacy for example. Um, but that's in essentially the, the path analysis that I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to look at. But that's a little bit further down the line. Then the third study, intervention development. So this is going to be a brief pilot study, feasibility study, comparing methods of increasing physical activity. So there's going to be three conditions. The first one's going to be um, autonomy supportive workshops, so this is based on self determination theory. The second one's going to be autonomy supportive workshops plus some components of psychological flexibility. So this could be mindfulness training, for example, or uh, exercise in cognitive diffusion. And then finally, we've got a control group, which is likely to be education or information only. And participants that I'm looking at, uh, we call them white collar workers, 18 to 64 years old, because that's the, the definition of the general population in terms of the, the population that I'm looking at, males and females. And then intervention length, we're looking around six weeks. Like I said, it's going to be a brief intervention. Um, and that just sort of follows a few protocols that I've read. Six weeks seems to be the sort of general sort of length. Um, but that's still, in, all this is still in development. It's going to be something that I'm going to look at once I've got my first sort of data in. And then we're going to do some follow-ups afterwards. So for the workshops, for example, it's autonomy supportive um, intervention. So we're looking at provision of choice and rationale. Uh, so this up to the increased autonomy, need satisfaction. Um, smart goal setting, feedback, which is going to help with the uh, competence. And then we've got this fostering of the warm and encouraging relationships within this workshop, which is the relatedness. Then the psychological flexibility components, um, there's quite a few in there to add in. So you've got workability, this idea of creative hopelessness, um, and then just teaching exercises in terms of mindful awareness, acceptance, and cognitive diffusion. So 
essentially what I'm asking is whether these components can actually add value to an autonomy supportive intervention. And then we've got the education based control condition. So this is just literally providing people information, information that they can get from the website. There's, um, there's a booklet from the Ministry of Health that's available to anyone in New Zealand. Uh, so this is just essentially presenting them information. Obviously I need to make sure that I'm balancing for time, which could be a bit of a challenge actually, because seeing people in a lecture is going to be very difficult for six weeks, one hour a week. Um, but that's something that that's, that's what I'm looking to do so far. And then the key outcome measures I'm looking at. So these will be taking a baseline post-intervention and then follow-ups. So this is going to be yeah, psychological flexibility, need satisfaction, motivation, and self-reported physical activity, which can be translated into metabolic equivalent units. Um, so that's what I'm looking at as a sort of quantitative measure of physical activity. Um, so in sum, psychological flexibility might be an important aspect or important support for autonomous motivation. Uh, there is definitely potential for incorporating psychological flexibility components into this already established paradigm of autonomy supportive interventions. So we're looking at increasing our understanding. Like I said, it's, it's not just about the social context in terms of motivation. I know there are theories of motivation out there that also look internally, but I'm trying to bring these two together. And it's a very important health issue, public health issue. I mean, I think we're all very aware of the, the importance of physical activity and increasing physical activity globally. And positive results from this should be used to inform future intervention development, as I just said before. Thank you. Thank you.